how you are measuring your success. Because I think at this point, we really have to allow ourselves to step away from the measurement of followers, likes, whatever, and look at the engagement of the followers that you have. Welcome to Built with me, Katie chung Listen every week as I talk with athletes, entertainers, and entrepreneurs about how they built who they are today and get the inside scoop about their lives. Fitness model, weight loss expert, biggest loser trainer, ex-American gladiator, fitness director of Shape Magazine, and an author. Is that enough credentials for you guys? I don't <laughs> know if there's anything that I left out, but we have the one and only Jen Wiederstrom today. And thank you, Jen. I know you're in Florida and it's kind of weird what's going on right now. And you kind of got stuck in Florida because you're working with a client, right? Yep, correct. Well, thank you for giving the time to talk to me. I don't know if you guys know, we have a cool story about how we met, Mm -hmm. which I kind of like to tell people. We auditioned or tried out. I want to say audition because it's like a show. We tried out for WWE together. (laughs) Well, I think other people tried out. I don't know what I did. <laughs> it was so funny. We had quite a class. When I say like, like our graduating class of that, that season of WWE, like it was you, me, Colin, Callum Van Mauger, Lena, you know, yeah, Callum was in there. And then um, Lena, I mean, now, I mean, you guys know her as Nia Jack. She's a W, she made it. She was picked just this beautiful, strong, inside and out so woman beautiful. that will just crush your face and your soul. <laughs> and and um, she's out there doing it. But yeah, that's how, that's how you and me met. Gosh. You know, they told us that that was the best tryout, like athletically, that they have ever had. I mean, that makes me feel better because I, because <laughs> it's like that, that, that experience it's funny, the athleticism part was easy to me. I thought, oh, you want me to flip and it's kind of creepy and you lean on the ropes and there's like, you know, they gave us like beginner ropes and it's, you know, especially if you're a visual learner, you can kind of see how someone does it. Uh, the WWE, I thought had great coaches, had great cueing, were very helpful. So it's cool to hear that we were the most athletic uh, batch of, uh, you know, potentials. But the hardest part to me was when you had to be a character. Okay, let me tell you, the hardest (laughs) thing, no, I'm not even kidding you. When people ask me, like, what's the hardest thing that you've done in your life? And I'm I'm the same with you, like the athletic part of it, I loved it. I was like, yes, give it to me, backflip, sure, why not? Like, I'm just gonna try it. But the scariest thing to me was when they were like, you're gonna go in character in front of 300 people, Yep. you're gonna have cameras on you, you're gonna have the people in the farm, the experts, the coaches, they're all watching you. You're going in front of everyone and you're in character and you have to brag about yourself or tell a story. And if I would have known that going in, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Like, I don't know if I would have done it. I mean, you go to the audition. Yeah, that is, that was so terrifying to me, Jen, but I did it. And I was like, okay, I'm just, I grew as a person. And that was so scary for me to stand up in front of those people and just not know. Yeah. But you, like sorry you actually did it i i did it you know there was like those three girls that didn't even didn't even try remember one pretended she was sick or something classic we've all been there we've all faked sick yeah for sure i know we're kind of talking in like code here but like part of the tryout you guys is is you have to go in front of everyone and you have to create like curate and perform your own in essential like in a sense WWE character and it's not necessarily going to make it to the actual ring but it's their ability to see your charisma your creativeness your commitment to those moments I mean so much of what they what they offer in in this sport is entertainment I mean I think I was like hi I'm Jen Wiederstrom I just really care about people and I don't know that this is for me like I didn't even try I just said I'm just here to help the world be better I, I I mean I like people were kind to me but like they were like what the fuck is this? Why did she even, <laughs> why did she even go up? Because people, I mean, had full on characters and they just, I mean, nailed it. I remember Naya made up this role. She made up this person called Gemini with a split personality. And yeah. I was like, 
wow. I'm so, wow. That, and, but, but that's also sets people apart. You realize there is such a, there's such a talent and a gift in that, in that conduit of the way they perform that I was like, oh yeah, I, I could be the best back flipper wrestler on the planet. If you don't have that spirit in you to do that, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I know the, the casting or the agent, whoever recruited us, Canyon, he was like, hey, how are you feeling? What's going on? I'm like, man, I love it. I love like this athleticism. I love being challenged physically. Like I'm having so much fun. And he's like, okay, I just want to remind you that yeah, it's fun. But at the same time, like that's such a small part. The whole bigger part is your character and being on TV. And so I just- And they loved you, Katie. You were such a favorite. You were like- oh, you're so nice. Such a favorite. Oh, you know, I kind of, I, I kind of told him I- I went knowing that it wasn't really something that I wanted to sure. end up doing. It was just, it wasn't my forte. It wasn't, it wasn't my thing. You have yeah. to live and breathe, you know, WWE. You know, things happen when you leave the house. And mm -hmm. I went thinking, I'm going, I'm yeah. going to go. I, and we had a mutual friend, Sean Perrine, rest in peace, that both encouraged us both to do it. And and I think, I, I agree with you. I learned something about myself. I still have friendships from that weekend. I mean, yours and ours included. And it was funny because after that, let's see, that was a December. It was like the month of December or November. And that very next fall, that, or that spring, that March or April, I auditioned for Biggest Loser for the third time and I got it. And that was, I, so that came after. And I think there's something to, being in a position where I had to stand in for all in front of all these people. And I was like, I just know, like you knew, I'm like, it's not for me. I don't know how I know. I just feel like it's a no. But when I went and stood in front of Biggest Loser, and again, that was the third time I auditioned, I knew it was right that time. So I think there is a, something about putting yourself out there, knowing who you are and how that comes through you changes based on if it's the right opportunity for you. Absolutely. And like I said, being that terrified and doing that, you walk away. There's, there's no way you walk away being a worse person, right? You're walking yeah. away and I grew and I got just that much more. I don't even know if it's confidence, but I wasn't as scared. So now the next time that I have to do something like, Hey, I've already done it. And so it helps you grow. And so I'm grateful yeah. that I almost had to shit my pants and do that. And like, I was so scared, <laughs> but at the same time, like, I got it done and then I was like, you know what? Throw the next ball at me. Like, I'm good, I'm ready, and yeah. And I wonder if it's something like, it's very hard to think about ourselves as individuals, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we process. And when we keep it to ourselves, we kind of feel like we're the only ones that feel that way or the only one that feels insecure going out there. Like I told you, like Naya nailed it, but she was just as nervous as you and I. And when we kind of get to air out to others, like pieces of ourselves, and I think it actually creates strength because you realize I'm not the only one that thinks this way, or I'm not the only one that was nervous, or I'm not the only one that thought about this. And, you know, I don't know. I think it just creates this common ground and it creates a strength in who you are because by sharing it, you realize there is this commonality and and I think that the differences make me feel proud. So what feels similar makes me feel stronger. What makes me, and what's different makes me proud of myself for fe being different, not just to be different because it's who, I, but because it's who I am. Absolutely. Yeah. So did you, how did you actually get into the fitness industry? Oh gosh, it was such an accident. I've told the story before, but you know, I had grown up doing sports um, throughout my childhood and mainly gymnastics. And then in college, I started as a rower and then walked onto the track team like uh, almost like my junior year. So fitness or movement was always tied to performance. And then when I got out of college, I was bartending in Chicago, just drinking my face off, having a blast. And I remember I did fitness modeling for the first time. And I thought I, in an hour, I can make as much as I do in a, you know, a night of bartending because it's like you know 300 bucks and i signed away all my rights to the photos which are still on like shipping trucks and stuff because i just said take the pictures i'll take 300 bucks and so so that's what kind of opened the door to bit to um american gladiators but again katie it was working out for a performance it was to look a certain way uh for the tv and to not you know be beaten by contenders kind of a thing and then 
it wasn't until I moved to LA and I was running out of money really quickly and I wasn't doing TV anymore and I really didn't know what to do and I wanted to work at a gym so I could get a free membership. And it was, it, the gym is still there. It's called Pulse Fitness Studio and it's in Sherman Oaks. And I wanted to be the check-in person, like the greeter. And the owner goes, oh, I don't know. I, I think you should be a coach. Like you should be teaching classes. And I was like, oh, no, no, I don't do that. I don't, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to greet. I'll get here at 5 a.m. I just want to work out for free. And Mark, the owner said, listen, work out for free and just shadow my classes. And so I learned and he really uh, kind of gave me this apprenticeship through group classes. So if anybody out there listening is smiling with me, I, my, my foundation is group class training and, you know, treadmills and bands and weights. And I, and that's where I started in fitness. I, I realized that, and I just, I love, I, you know, I call us civilians. We're just everyday humans and heroes that just are trying to get it through another day, keep our, butts a little tighter and you know watch the the amount of beer we drink at the end of the day you know what i mean just really trying to meet the middle and i met so many great people and i fell in love with the way i saw fitness change people in their behavior and their eye contact and their attitude and the brightness of the colors they wore in class and and that was probably back in 2009 where i started really truly in fitness as a group fitness instructor so you were actually, you got into fitness almost after, because you were on American Gladiator in 2008, correct? Correct. What was that? What was that like? I mean, as far as you could imagine. All I, all I know or remember about American Gladiator was when my dad watched it back in the 90s. I had to actually look that up because I was like 80s. So Wait, are you? Didn't you watch it? Yeah, but I'm a, I'm a 90s, late 80s baby. So, oh, you yeah. missed it. Yeah, oh, so I like you. Yeah, I vaguely remember it where like they were on there with the the thing. Yeah. And the <laughs> yeah. So, how was that? Did you guys? I mean, is it kind of? I kind of think of it as WWE, where you practice and you have you're almost performing, but you do you know who's gonna win? I mean, no, because you have no, like, gosh, no, it's, it's an all out battle. So, you know, I grew up watching the old late 80s early 90s so we're you know and it, it, it by the way just go to espn classics and you guys will find out what i'm talking about on google american gladiators it's they were just like such athletic gladiators and the women were like strong and muscular and like beautiful and i remember jazz this was this beautiful black woman with like this jed like almost like braids or dreads or something and she, I, I just looked up to her and Zap and anyway, um, when it came back, it was like a dream come true. And so what we, I mean, we all went full go. It was, it was, it wasn't like, it was like, okay, this is what's going to happen. And this is going to happen. And we got very little practice. The only events we got practice on was the wall, the rings. Um, there was a jow set up so we could kind of figure out balance and what was, the right way to kind of like just to kind of reorient yourself but otherwise we were thrown out there like i remember the first time i did pyramid i'd never done it and you go to the top and you're like you're almost getting vertigo you're so high up and you're like i'm supposed to tackle <laughs> someone down this thing i look over i'm and i'm competing with gina carano who was crushed and she's like ready to she's just like those little girls were like a little like a, a, you know I don't know, like a half a sandwich, just like boop, boop, boop. Like she could just suplex them and flip and roll. And I was like, hi, I did gymnastics. I lifted weights for a while. Not quite sure how to do this. Um, so you just went all out. And But there was the pride of your own personal win and loss record. There was the pride and the pressure of the team. Because the gladiators, like, we didn't take it easy on anybody. We wanted to, we, it was like bragging rights. So it, it, it was fun. And by the way, those contestants were tough. I mean, they, they were not, there were no schlubs, like, but you had to move to catch them, which was fun. So, it, I mean, it was just, every day was of games, 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 games. And like the best hair and makeup of your life. Like I had hot pink hair, extra lashes. I got to wear like pink lips. I'm like, every day I felt like an anime character. And I was like, I'm so hot. Like I, if my outfit wasn't so tiny, I might have gone grocery shopping in it, but I just wouldn't have been the right attention. 
any, <laughs> any attention's good attention. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so, <laughs> well, it was, I mean, my booty was hanging out the back. Uh, Katie, it was tiny. I think that somehow, I was like, how did you get the job? I'm like, I think I agreed to like bleaching my hair because it was all my real hair. So my hair was bleached white and they put the pink in and I think I had the tiniest outfit. I'm like, that probably didn't hurt. Because like, yeah, what am I gonna, one of the best bodies no. on that show. So they what? loved it. I said, you had one of the best bodies on that show. Oh, you probably loved it. it. Oh, uh, thank you. Let's put her in the smallest outfit possible. But we had like Beth Horn. She was a epic. She was a legend in the fitness industry. Um, Valerie Wagaman, she was a figure competitor and Beth was a fitness. So she was Beth did the gymnastics and the flipping and stuff. She was a pro. Valerie Wagaman, she was a pro in the figure uh, industry. I mean, the, I mean, these women, I was just like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. They're like, what are you having for lunch? I was like, sushi? <laughs> I didn't even know, I you know, know what's healthy. Right? I was just going to get a big, big sandwich. So like, okay, let's tighten this up, you know? So they had to like teach me a lot and it was great. We had, so, I mean, everyone loved everybody. It wasn't, there was no ego, not, certainly not amongst the women. And we had, a, we had each other's backs. It was really good. That's great to hear. Yeah. So second show was The Biggest Loser. And yes. I assume, I mean, that show is just so many highs and so many lows. and it's just, I, I guess, tell me a little bit about your experience or maybe something that we didn't see on camera that, that really resonated with you or, you know, meant a lot. I think, um, thanks for asking that question, first of all. Um, as a, you know, a lot of, they brought a lot of women in cycling around Jillian. So it was really uh, a, a personal test for myself, not giving into what production thought they needed to have a successful show, which was the yelling and the aggressiveness that Jillian was successful with, and really sticking to who I am and what I know like feeds the human spirit and ultimately would help my people be successful. And I know Jill gets a lot of shit for the way she coached, but I think that the reality is, and what's important to point out is she was exactly who she was. And that's what made her specifically so successful. She wasn't faking, she wasn't trying. She's pretty harsh, she's pretty intense. She can be pretty mean. And that's how she coached and that was her way. Mine was far more compassionate, committed in different ways. I mean, I think the hardest part of the show is what, you know, if you think each episode's an hour long and when you take away commercials, you're looking at 42, 45 minutes. The hours that were filmed, you know, of uh, footage are cut down to those 42 minutes and you have to share between myself, one or two other trainers, a challenge, a weigh in, our host, Bob, you know, so I mean, to, to, to diversify the hour enough, like you just can't go as deep as I'd like. But I think my favorite things were the off camera time that where there was no cameras, there was it, it just us and like I would go Sunday mornings and there were always like these strawberry farmers that would have those baskets of strawberries. So I'd bring, I'd bring strawberries and we'd, they'd make me breakfast and coffee and we'd sit and maybe do a hike. Or I remember once I snuck in some wine my first season because there's no alcohol, anything. And we were beat up mentally. Like my hair was turning gray. I was losing my hair. You're so stressed because all the contestants, regardless of the team they're on, become important to you. And you fight so hard not to like, not just to win, not for bragging rights, but every time I get to win as a team, it means I get everybody one more week, one more chance to be here together to, you know, um, really configure those habits into their daily like routine, into their own self-confidence, like more time on tension with me creates more success at home for them. And I mean, I, I just remember we were so stressed because you just don't know what's gonna happen. And I, and I, and I, I mean, I think I had two bottles of wine and, and there was like 10 of them. I mean, like nobody got drunk, but it was this human moment where we all like, we all got coffee mugs because we, we, it was, it's illegal. You can't have wine on campus. And we had like coffee mugs, like we were drinking tea. And I was like, like I felt like at a high school dance and we all got like two inches of wine and we were like, and it just felt good to sit and have like that human moment together with, with everybody, regardless of team, you know? And um, the, those are the times that I miss the most because especially with that show, if, if you make the show about, uh, you know, really taking advantage of the contestant's story, 
for for exploiting their lives for ratings versus really putting the people first you're going to have very different outcomes and very different shows and i you know i think that's the biggest that's the biggest thing that you would never see and you wouldn't know i mean i was there every day dolphet never came if the cameras were on and that's a reality and I'm, i'll say it and he won't deny it you know like it's just that that's a big difference for those people that realize oh you're there for the tv show you're not here for me and that's i don't know it's i think it's a big differentiator well i think that really shows who you are and your values and ethics as a person. And, you know, I always preach to people that being happy and being healthy together, if you can find that perfect combo, that's what's right. And I feel like you've really embraced that. Even mm -hmm. in your training, it's, it's you want them to enjoy the journey, to learn how to do this long-term, to be healthy mentally and physically, not just like shed the pounds and, win a show or just lose weight temporarily doing it unhealthy or you're not mentally able to take it like you really you've really built the perfect model i think and you show that in you like you have a phenomenal body you're so positive you're so helping and so i guess um how have you really made that happy and healthy relationship with yourself and also just for other people to live by um, well, first of all, thank you for all that. That was so kind of you um, and sincere, so thank you. Um, it's interesting, and science proves it, but when you have a healthy body, your mind also becomes healthier. When you have a healthy mind, your body can also be healthier. If they're interwoven, they're not separate. And I think I, I really got here on accident because, and I think you will attest to this, at the amount of competing that you have done, you can be shredded and lean and be very unhappy and you can it's very misleading um and that's why you see so many people with a a shell that maybe looks like it's supposed to be a way but it wasn't achieved necessarily the healthiest way and i realize there's layers to what it takes in that sport to you know cut carbohydrates cut water be stage ready and i'm not i'm not outing any of that but i will say that there there's a process for what I call, you know, civilians here that, that can be done hand in hand. And when for a long time, even through all of my gladiator days, it was a very crash diet and then binge after I'm done with the photo shoot or the, or the show or whatever it is. It was a crash and binge and a constant yanking and yo-yoing of my own dysmorphia, my own mental happiness that was 1000% tied to what my body looked like. And I didn't know how I'd gotten so far off track because I vividly remember, like I was in college, I was wearing like size 10 pants. I mean, and I was muscular, but I was kind of chubby. Like you can scroll back and see pictures of me. And I was having two Chipotle burritos in a sitting. Like there's, I would eat the entire pizza. So like I, I, I but I was also training a lot. Like my, my squat max was 315. I could bench 225. My snatch was over 190 pounds for my sport. And it was weird. I remember never associating my pant size with being negative. I was never not confident around guys. I never was worried about my, my perfect outfit for to, if I was going to go out to a club or something. I just was like, I'm Jenny. I'm Je I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to associate happiness, worth, um, or my ability to be happy with my, any amount of my appearance. And it's funny, even the ego around my weights, which now I kind of feel pr proud of, nobody gave a shit about. Like on the throwing team, I was the weakest. Like 315 squat, I knew my, my teammates could have repped that for five reps, <laughs> you know? So it was different because, and I think that like, there wasn't a comparison. And I think at some point along the way, maybe it was gladiators, maybe it was, I, I did one figure competition and the comparison, and I'd love to hear your take on it, but I got so down this dark, dark rabbit hole of comparison and value. And I just knew Katie, if I kept going down that hole, I wasn't gonna be able to get out, whether that meant an eating disorder, uh, pills, drinking, um, soothing with attention from men or food or all. And I just knew, I, I mean, frankly, what, 
what got me out and what, 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 what urged me to find that balance of the happy, healthy in and out was that I, I know for me, and I know you're in a relationship, you're, you're really like, you, you've been the happiest I've ever seen you and I'm single. And yet I know a relationship for me is going to be very, very, it's, it's one of my, it's going to be one of my greatest accomplishments. Like I'm so excited to be in a relationship I am proud of. And I know, when I knew at like 27-ish, 25-ish, that area, that if I didn't get that right in my head, I would destroy the right relationship, even if I ever found it. So to think of how hard it is to find the right person for you in the match and build a life together, I knew that this would tear me apart from my insecurity, my behavior, my out, like out, like lashing out on that person because of what I wasn't willing to look at. And I just thought, if you're ever going to be suitable, and I, what I mean that as mentally healthy enough for a real relationship, you've got to start here. So that's really what started it. It had nothing to do with like a show or like a, a, a waist, you know, like a pant size. It was really like my own mental health. And my body has become the bonus. Like my waistline is always a side effect and of, of how I actually feel mentally about myself. So really? I, I honestly, that's the reason why I stopped competing because I wasn't happy. I hate dieting. I hate, I hate, I guess that extreme dieting. It has taught me a lot because now I know I can look at something and, and generalize like this is what I should and shouldn't eat, obviously, but competing, I was miserable and you're on stage for a second, literally. And I realize that I'm not happy doing this. So what's the point in doing something if I'm not happy? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the point of life is to be happy, right? So what's, it's you've so got to make those changes. <laughs> yes. But I will tell you, you know, you've stopped, but you know, there are, and you know, go share as much as you'd like, Katie, but like there are lingering effects for you. Yeah. I remember we had a, we FaceTime a month ago and your, your own, your body has been going through so much and you were nervous about posting current pictures. And I was like, what the fuck? Why? Mm-hmm. Because like, I love, like, I love your body. Like I love your shape. You have a softness and a beauty and like you're elegant and you're exotic all in one way, you know, but like you're still comparing where you are now to perhaps not stage, but like within what, eight pounds of stage. And it's like, that's not current, it's not real, and it's probably not healthy, and it certainly wasn't happiness for you. Absolutely, well, thank you. You're so sweet about my image. I, um, yeah, when we talked, I know I'm not the only one because I've, it's come to my attention that a lot of other ex-competitors are fighting through the same thing, but, uh-huh. you know, dieting and doing those extreme competitions, not only have I seen a lot of girls have stomach issues, digestive issues, but now hormone and thyroid, And I think it's so important, just kind of off topic, that these competitors now need to realize that stuff that they're either taking or diets that they're doing have long-term effects. And my body, just because I don't know if the extreme dieting or the training or whatever it may be, like now that I'm getting older, like I'm having thyroid issues, I'm having hormone issues. And yeah, physically I'm trying to figure that out. But then you have the mental part where I'm like comparing myself to who I was, to what I used to look like. And then you pull social media into all of it. And now it's like, why don't I look like that girl? Or why don't I look like the other girls are, they're not buying my fitness program because I don't look as good as this girl who's maybe taking Anavar or, you know, doing extreme dieting or isn't healthy behind the scenes. So there's a lot of mind games that go into coming off of, I guess, competing and staying in the fitness industry and then adding social media on top of that. So. Dude, you funny. You're like, yeah. not to take this off topic. I'm like, I think this is the topic. Yeah. The topic. And I, you know, I, I think that there's gotten, social media has gotten funny. I mean, I know there are gals that I met that used to have like less than 10,000 followers and I helped and I mentored and then they, have a million now and some, like, now they don't return my text messages when I say happy birthday. Oh, like, no. Okay, homie, like, okay, apparently, you know, you're too cool for me now. But I, 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 I laugh because there seems to be this feeling around scarcity for like, oh, if I, if I post and tag a picture of Jen, well, then maybe she'll get like, she'll get those followers. It's like, 
Oh, you know? don't even get me started on that. I but, see people do it all the time. We're like, the only time I really don't tag people or if I'm weird about that is if like they don't want the attention or they have kids or I don't know what sort of attention they want. But I see like other people intentionally not tag people so that they don't get their followers or it's like a competition and it drives me crazy. Like, oh, no, just don't take a picture with me. My feelings ain't hurt. I'm going to take pictures all day. I go to the Arnold Classic too, okay? We're fine. <laughs> But like, that's the thing, like what I, I, I and, and it's, it's really funny, really strong women love other strong women. There's real true alphas know how to share the wheel and share the road. And it's the ones that are insecure about being found out are the ones that don't. Yeah. And that's okay. But what I, I bring it all up because they're, what you're going through, I would rather go to someone like you that's experiencing what you've experienced both on stage, off stage protocols, now post stage protocol for what your body's experiencing. Be like, dude, she's living it. She's actively seeking, like, whether it's solution, a new pathway, whether it's food combinations, workouts, or mental health around it, versus the girl that's like Shred City that has no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. It's like, I, 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 and, and there, you have a voice that many need to hear. And, and I, I mean, I got into, somebody got really twitchy with me about um, like some of the Instagram accounts that are, you know, that's like it's a lot of TNA, and they're like, well, Jen Selter, like she's not a fitness person, and this and that. And I go, yeah, but if one person sees that butt photo and is motivated to get off the couch and maybe squat, what? Why the fuck do this is great? Thank you, Jen Selter, for posting that photo. It doesn't matter. It's her life. It's up to her. But I, I don't care. Why? Why are we judging Jordy and who's allowed to offer inspiration, no matter who it goes to or how it it comes? I don't know. Maybe maybe someone watched the porn for the first time and said, you know what? I am gonna get in better shape. I don't care. Why do we, why do we care? Why don't we share the road? I mean, I, so that's why, you know, let people do what they want. It's just, it's just the, it gets tough with some of the people that are, you know, are self-proclaimed, you know, workout experts when you're just like, that's not an exercise. That is something that I actually wrote down that I wanted to talk to you about because there, well, I'll back up. So part of the reason why I'm keeping kind of the, my struggle with my diet not so exposed is because I want to make sure that I know what I'm talking about when I'm explaining certain things. So I can share my journey mentally. And I think you're right. And that, that might be something that I should put out there because there's maybe other people going through the same thing, but I want to make sure that I'm providing the right information on a solution. Or once I find out what it is, I can educate people for the better. And I know that it's so hard on social media. There is no regulation. People can post whatever they want. They can post absurd exercises. And you're one of the most educated trainers that I know, hands down. And I guess, I mean, what are your tips or advice to other trainers and social media experts out there? Because I know they need to hear it. And I'm going to let you say it. This is a term I got. I went to school in Kansas. And so I got this term there. But sometimes you got to step in shit to appreciate a clean boot. And I started to really get frustrated and like I was looking at what people are doing and I see accounts that are doing well and I'm like it's not even correct form you're not even doing the right you know whatever it was and I go what do you Jen stop like it, regardless of views keep your eyes on your own paper keep your eyes on your own road and if people want my help I will my door is open and I will always help mentor share talk speak at a comp anything but I can spend the energy here leaking, fawning over accounts that are, are, are literally just grabs for likes and, and followers, or keep that energy here, focus on what I do best. And I honestly, the biggest thing I did and what I would tell other trainers is um, shift how you are measuring your success. Because I think at this point, we really have to allow ourselves to step away from the measurement of followers, likes, whatever, and look at the engagement of the followers that you have. Because I gotta tell you, like every week, I feel like I get unfollowed by about 
I get followed by like over 2000 people every week. And then I'm unfollowed by like 1950. And <laughs> yeah. I was like, why is my number not moving? And it really used to upset me. And I go, it's all a game. It's all robots. It's all stuff. And if people are leaving, thank God. And if people that are real are coming and they're staying, great. I just know that the people that I have there, I've never bought followers. I've never, you know, fake for engagement. I can show you my bank account and let you know the conversion rate and my purchase programs on my challenges. And it's, and it's only increasing because I, instead of bleeding my energy out at looking what other people are doing, it focused on my messaging, what I love doing and really moving the needle for the people that are there in that community. And that's what I'm saying for me, my measurement of success was no longer, I need to get to a half a million followers. I need to get to, you know, this, I started to think like, okay, my measurement of success was getting uh, user feedback, the user generated direction from where my programming and teaching needed to go. Anyone that, that's followed me for a while can look at my Instagram, literally COVID hit, and I took a massive pivot on my Instagram because I was like looking at my Instagram at, and I was like, you wouldn't know for a second that I'm like a health and wellness coach. Like I had posted a picture of like a honey badger. I think I had a picture of pizza. I, 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 I there might've been a one workout and I just looked like, like some random chick. And I was like, do you want to be a resource or not? People are constantly asking me for more support, more motivation to put myself out there. And I wasn't doing any of it. So I was like, okay. So for me, my measure of success was as I was actually utilizing the user feedback and putting it into what I was sharing. And frankly, it's converted to dollars, but I wasn't after the dollars in the first place. That wasn't what it was about. And I think that's the kind of place where I think most trainers need to go mentally with their business and with how they share their training. Absolutely. I think that's one of the number one tips that everyone tells you successful with people is if you chase the money, you're never going to be successful. Huh, yeah. Well, and by the way, people can feel it. Yeah. I, when I follow people, if I feel like it, I, I've met a lot of people at fitness events and if I strike a connection with you and I like you, I'll follow you. And I will equally unfollow you if what you're posting is not interesting to me. If I feel like I'm being sold, if I feel like you're bullshit, if I can tell somebody else is writing your posts, I'm out. I'm gone. And that's it. And that's for me. And I, I saw that person. And I'd be like, so good to see you. But I, I don't need you clogging up my feed with BS. And that is like a big direct differentiator for me. Yeah, absolutely. So fitness director of Shape Magazine, you've written your own book. You have all these challenges online. How do you continue to evolve in this fitness industry? Because you're still so successful year after year. I feel like you just continue to grow. Oh, thanks for saying that. I think sometimes when you're in the frame, you can't see the picture. And I, I really, I, I think I had to start listening to what really made me the happiest um, because like Biggest Loser to me felt like it was pinnacle. And when I did the shows and the seasons and you know, the show evolves and has new trainers now. And at first I was angered by it and I thought that's what success meant. And I, and I had to really re, again, allow myself to adapt and understand that and listen to what made me happy. Biggest Loser, loser was great. I love the people I met. I still talk to my contestants every day. I love my producers. I love, I love the experience. But what makes me the happiest is really working with people, hearing what they're going through, helping them with their story, and helping them share it so other people see the evidence of what's possible if they actually took that risk on themselves. And what I think I've done and why I think it's come through as success is because it's just, it's as real as it gets. And I try to kind of treat the world like it's one single person. I feel the concern. I'm there and I truly listen. I mean, I'm the only one that runs my social media. I'm the only one that answers all my emails and it's not scalable. And I know that, but I know it's real. And so do they, you know, I, and I think that my personal touch on the way I do things has been really a, 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 a separator. Um, and I think that was the other thing I had to realize I loved coaching on Biggest Loser, but it was so limiting because the show owned me for so much of the year. I had so much travel that I wasn't getting to coach. And now like I'm, I'm working with a client, like 
again, I teach my challenges and I'm like, oh, I love coaching. It's my favorite thing to do. And I had gotten away from that. And I think the only reason I have kind of found this success that continues to evolve and, um, and grow is because I've made that my front and center piece and everything else has kind of taken care of itself. And I know it's kind of a basic answer, but it really has done it. it I haven't had to push that hard. I just, the hardest part was finding the right channels, the right conduits to do so. So like whether it's my 30 day challenges or the app I've launched, I'm finding more traction in that in helping people than I was traveling to three different cities a month hosting fitness events. And yes, I had these points of contact and impact. It was like one and done. And I'm like, well, where, where's that traction for that person? How do I get to stay in their life? And, and that's where I've kind of skewed my business this way. I think it's important too, to point out what you said about tying yourself to a brand and how after the biggest loser kind of scared you a little bit to say the least. And especially I guess in the time that I was in the industry, it was really important to be sponsored by a supplement company. Yes. If you were tied to that company. If you weren't with anybody, then you weren't somebody. And at least that's how I felt, you know? And so it was like, everyone, who are you signed with? Oh, are you working with them now? Or who are you going to the Arnold with? And I, you know, I've left companies and parted ways with other companies and that I still feel that as in like, that was my success or I was tied to success because they were successful instead of focusing on what I can provide. Because even on social media, I am my own brand and I can go out and I can help people just like you said, getting more rewards and impacting more lives by being your own brand and being successful on your own, not tying your name to somebody else. Dude, so well said. I had to go through that disassemblement mentally. Like, cause I thought, why was I angry about Biggest Loser? I was like, because it makes me feel powerful, makes me feel like elite, uh, above, like it was a separator for me with all the other Instagram, whoever's. I'm like, there's only one Biggest Loser female trainer, right? And that's me. So I like that it separated me. I like that it let me change lives. I liked that I was able to reach a lot of people. And, I, and, when, and when that show was taken away, I felt like all of those qualities were also taken away because I assigned Biggest Loser as responsible for why I was important, separate, elite, you know, life-changing and could reach millions. Dude, I am still separate, elite, reach, I, I am that same person and I had to realize if you assign that supplement company and you assign that brand as ownership of why you have these qualities, then it's like you assigning being beautiful and worthy because you're in a relationship. And then when the guy dumps you, you're no longer beautiful and worthy. Fuck that. I am no matter what, but it's understanding that it comes from you and that's what makes you attractive to a brand. So, you know, finally I'm in a position where I make all my own money and now I don't have to say yes to any brands. I choose to, and I get to collaborate and work with them, and it feels exciting. The fact that they might give me some money on the side is dope. Like, I'll put that in my savings or take my parents to Hawaii. Perfect. But the reality is it changes. It's like the value changes. Like, I know it's like a, it's like a healthy relationship versus a bad one. Absolutely. I realize it's a value exchange now with brands, whereas, I, I mean, I remember fitness modeling in the late 2000s and early teens when you were really, I mean, you, that was a big time for you too. I remember like you weren't anybody unless you had a supplement person, you know, company. And now, I mean, I remember, I mean, Optimum a few months ago offered me this big contract and I said, no, I was like, I don't really. Didn't know. it feel good though to like say no? Because that's yeah. how I felt too, is I'm like, now I'm pickier with my brands. Yes. And one, yep. I want to be authentic right? So I want, when I do sell something, when I do suggest something, know that it's coming from a place of, Hey, this works. And I take it myself. So yeah. I'm not going to work with anybody that I wouldn't. And yeah, you have the freedom to be yourself because now you're valuable. You're not valuable because you're tied to something. Well, and so it's who you trust. Like there is, if, 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 if I see you got your nails done, I go, yo, Katie, where'd you go? Who'd you see? Yeah. I would trust your word in a heart. By the way, these are pop-ons. Oh, good job. Oh, you my nails done, girlfriend. <laughs> I'm here. But, you know, we, we trust, it, it, when you are someone of privilege, 
it, you ha you carry responsibility. You just do. And I have to have genuine endorsement just like you to, to know that, it, it, that you have to know that what you say is meaningful to people, who I recommend and what I recommend. It's, it's, it's everything. And that's uh, frankly how you build further trust with who's relying on you. Absolutely. Okay. I have one last question. I know we've been talking for a while. What out of all the things that you've done, all the things you've accomplished and just the fitness industry that you've been in as a whole and outside of it, what is your most memorable moment? Oh my gosh, this is, I feel like I have so many. Um... You can give us a couple. I just want to know, I know that you've, you've done some really cool things in your life and you have your hands, you wear a lot of different hats, you have your hands on a lot of different things, and I just would love your feedback on what yeah. your favorite part is. I think one thing that was really cool that happened, I haven't told many people this story, it was my first year of Biggest Loser, and Sean Perrine was the editor-in-chief of Muscle and Fitness, his and hers, him. put me on my very first cover for Muscle and Fitness, hers, and put Arnold on the, his cover the same month. And they threw us this big party. And you guys have to understand that Arnold Schwarzenegger, when I was a little girl, that was the poster on my, on my walls. I had, a, not Arnold, it was Conan the Barbarian, I'll have you know. And, <laughs> and I had like bodybuilding pictures of like him and like Linda Murray and you know, all these greats, Sean Ray, all these people. And I remember with Arnold, he was specifically really important to me because he had a long last name and so did I and nobody can pronounce it and you know, same with him. Uh, he talked really funny and I, I went to speech class for six years. So I really, I really struggled, um, and, um, and to speak out, you know, and share. And then, um, he, I always had, had muscles and he had a lot of muscles. So there was this, he, he made me feel like more okay. Um, he, because of the way he was in his small way, inspired me to like, my, in, you know, summers at high school, I would go lift in the weight room and it was only boys in there for summer football, but I would go in and train and I took it seriously. And it just was like a really interesting thing. So cut to this big night, it's at Gold's Gym. It's in the back of the Gold's Gym in Venice and Arnold's there and we're standing by our covers and, and I'm talking to him and I got an opportunity to introduce him. I'm like, because I had to talk and I'm like, I have to go first. Because if Arnold go first, no one's going to I can't follow Arnold. And so I was so nervous and I'm calling my father on the way to the venue. And I'm like, I don't know, dad, I don't know. I'm, uh, I couldn't even talk. I was like, I'm freaking out. I think I need a shot of tequila. And my dad's like, well, I'll tell you a story that'll help. And he basically shared the story, which I repeated to Arnold, that there was a little girl that had seen me on Biggest Loser and was running like, team gen workouts during recess oh and, my gosh. and of course so when i have a chance to introduce arnold my dad had just he had shared with me the story that i'm like you know i heard this today and i realized the reach of wellness is so grand and you just don't know who's listening and who's watching and who you're inspiring and i'm like and when this woman was an eight-year-old little girl i had this man's you know you know photo on my walls i pointed it posted pointed at arnold and I just, I just connected the dots of these generations of, of people and it made me, it was such a special moment because I don't, I, I think I realized for the first time that my impact was real. And it wasn't just what Arnold had said about me after I introduced him and the way he believed in me and the way he trusted me in the industry and really kind of passed the torch but it was coming from Arnold who'd been there before and perhaps from this little girl who might follow me next. And I just knew, and it wasn't about ego, like I've made it, I'm a superstar. I just knew for the first time, for real, I was, I make an impact. And, and in whatever, whatever size, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be millions. It could be like the 20 people in your, in your community or in your gym or your workout buddy. I knew without a doubt, I was someone that changes, I can change and help people immensely by being just exactly who I am. And I'll never forget it. And, um, and that I, I'm glad you're actually making me relive the story because I, I, when I remember it, I go, because it's easy to forget 
your impact. And I, and that was the first time I knew that I, w I was really on track doing what I was supposed to be doing with my purpose. That is such a great lesson. If there's one thing that I want anyone to take away from listening this whole time is that they make an impact, whether it be big or small, that you're making an impact. If you have 2000 followers on, on Instagram, yes. that's 2000 people you're reaching and you're making an impact. And as long as you continue to be you, your own brand, be authentic, be real, and know that you make an impact, then you have it figured out. I pro Katie, you said it perfectly because I wasn't, we weren't always at these followings. We started exactly where you guys are. Exactly. And the only thing I did not do was deviate from my truth with what I knew felt right. And like I said, eyes on your own paper, let it come from your heart and from a good place. And you're always going to end up in front of the person that needs you the most. And I, and I just know that. So yeah, absolutely. You know, I got a random Venmo yesterday of someone saying, here's $20. It's not much, but please go get a drink on me. Thank you for all of your fitness tips and videos. And it meant so much to me, just that little gesture that here's somebody that I don't know that found me, literally found me on Venmo. I had no idea. And wow. just wanted to say thank you. And I think uh, like that, that's one person that made me feel like, oh my gosh, I'm doing something right. Yes. So, you know, you, you have to realize that, you know, even though people may not vocalize it, that you are doing so much. Oh, that's so great, Katie. What are you going to get? That was like so nice. <laughs> it's a beautiful, what are you going to get? Oh, I mean, because you're in Vegas, that might be, get you a drink. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go get like four coffees or a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, exactly. I love that. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to thank you so much for your time, for, for spending your day with me. I know we talked for a little bit. I'm so grateful to know you. Continue to spread your love and kindness and your realness, the no bullshit type of person that I know you are. And if any of you guys need any sort of nutrition, training, guidance, she is the real deal. Follow her, Jen Wiedestrom. That's yeah. all across all social media, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just my full name. She can put it in the notes. I mean, the fact yeah. that you said it right the first time made me so happy. It's <laughs> Jen Wiedestrom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, man, I got to make sure I got that right. Thank you so much, Jen. I love you, honey. I love you.